So quick review, what is forgiveness? Biblically speaking, it means to let go of the need for punishment or revenge. So you're letting go of the need for punishment, or you might sometimes say justice. That's not the same as the government. That's why usually governments don't forgive. But we're talking about interpersonal relationship. Now, that's related to the feelings involved with the wound, but not exactly the same, at least not my view. That's why I said it is certainly possible to forgive someone and still have emotional wounds. Much like I give the analogy, someone could hit me by the car on accident and I break my leg, I limp for months, I go to physical therapy. I can forgive them, not want to sue them, not cuss their name, not want any harm to come to them at all, but I've still got work to do. I'm still wounded. And those are, those are different things. They are related, but they're not, it seems to me they're not the same thing. So, but since they're related, sometimes I, on forgiveness, we talk a lot about grief, which is why these things oftentimes go together. Under the why part, why? We're a disciple of Jesus. We're being forgiven right now. Two, I'm also remember I'm not flawless. Three, we're told we're commanded to forgive. We're commanded to. So it is a, Jesus was pretty clear cut about all that. And then also some things that are gonna help you like resentment or unforgiveness is an internal wound. It does hurt you. It does, you pay the price, like going to prison for a crime you didn't commit, and it, it stinks. It's hard to muster up re resentment all the time, every time. And this is especially true. I know right now, because I have children, uh, my daughter particularly, a lot of times, so and so, oh, they just, not, but she'll have friends will say, oh, here they come, oh. And I mean, just to, to live there all the time. Every time I see blank, I've got to go, oh. And adults do the same thing too, but boy, that's, that's tiring. You know, that doesn't help. Forgiveness is the cure to that. We talked about forgiveness and, and time. Time alone won't heal it, so you need to process the hurt now. So that's why we do it. Why do we work on forgiveness? Because it helps you process the hurt. Forgiveness means you're saying, I'm not gonna just give it a bunch of time. Yes, some things are so minor that it only take a little bit of time. Yeah, of course, of course. Some things aren't minor. So some things you might say, I find that pretty easy to forgive so-and-so about so-and-so. Good. But so-and-so about so-and-so, that takes me, that man, I'm still struggling with that. Okay, I mean, that's okay. But we don't we don't trust time to heal it. We gotta work on forgiveness and that's a, that's a good thing. God gives us the ability to do it. And oftentimes when someone meets me and they have problems with counseling, anxiety, stress, not all the time, but oftentimes there might be some issue of a wound. Sometimes it might be woundedness mixed with forgiveness. Top of page six, this I think we're gonna stop last time here. Forgiveness is for you. It's, it is for you. Now, you should not wait around for the person to come and beg for forgiveness. Uh, you, now, now, is it good for a person to do that before we forgive them? Ideally, yes. If a person can say, I'm so sorry, it sure helps the forgiveness process. It sure does. In fact, this week's sermon, I'm going to talk about a little bit more of that. But, you, but ideally, healthy people do not need the other person to feel sorrow or repentance in order for you to forgive. And that's because if you need them to forgive, uh, if you need them to apologize, if you need them from the contrition, let me say it this way, if you need anything at all from them, they hold power over you, period. They hold power over you. And so they can say, nope, I don't care what, I don't care what I did. You're just wrong. You're just crazy. You're the crazy one. And they just need to understand what they did to hurt me. No, they don't need to understand it. If you do need for them to understand it, they can hold that power card over you or whatever the rest of your entire life, which means you are hooked to that person forever until they would just let me go and allow me to allow me to forgive them if they would just say, I'm sorry. Man, that is sick, unhealthy. And so many people are stuck in that craziness. Uh, the person's not crazy, I mean, that crazy situation. So healthy people say, I don't need you to feel sorrow or feel anything or repentance in order for me to forgive you. I don't. So you practice forgiveness because it heals you and because it's what Christians do, right? It's just it heals you, it's what Christians do, whether they feel sorrow or not. The other person never has to even know you forgave them. They don't have to. If you want to tell them, that's your choice, but it can't be because you want them to be embarrassed or hope that one day they'll fall on their knees in repentance. And I have people go, I just want you to know, I have forgiven you. <laughs> For what? <laughs> well, you know what you did. Or what, I mean, why did you tell me that? Why did you, I mean, really ask yourself that question. Why did you even tell them you forgave them? What, why tell them? What benefit was that in there? And we need to ask those, ex, we need to ask those desires of ourselves and 
before we do things. I often encourage people, because people encourage when I was younger too, and people I trusted and professors and whatnot, is a very good point is, well, before we have those conversations that we're struggling with, and maybe it's gonna be a hard conversation, always ask the question, what do I need out of this conversation? What do I want out of the conversation? Why do I want it, need and want those things? And man, it, it, it puts a lot of cold water in a lot of conversations. There are things, and I'm not, it's okay for people to have you, it's okay for people to have their opinion, I get it, it is. As a pastor, you have to deal with a whole lot of nonsense mm -hmm. complaining talks that what they want and need from you it ends up being they just want it done their way. They just want it done their way. And so they can't wait to tell you how much they don't like what you're doing because they want it done their way. Not because it's more like Jesus, not. And so because deep inside them, they want to be validated because they're transferring me as their parent. They want me to like them or validate them or love them or give them hope or encouragement. And so your idea is good too. I mean, that they need that from me. On a healthy sense, I would say is you shouldn't need that from me because I'm not your daddy, I'm not your Lord Jesus. Uh, well, you just need to know. Why do you, no, it's not I just need to know. That doesn't make any sense. And that goes for anybody. If I go to a person and go, you just need to know so-and-so. Why? And so the word I use all the time to sound Mr. Christian, I know, um, or Dr. Christian, is to say, is it redemptive? Is this really redemptive? Why tell them this? Is this genuinely, as far as I know my conscious self, for the good of the kingdom of God and for their good? If it is not, I close my mouth until I figure out whether or not I'm ever going to be there. Is it really for their good? I have told people that I have forgiven them because they wanted to hear it. Do you forgive me with that? I go, yes, I forgave you. I've known people who, you know, family members who I love dearly, who say, I, I really struggled years ago and blah, blah, blah. I go, oh, you need to hear that I forgive you? Well, I'm, you know, I'm the answer. Well, I forgive you. I, I, that's okay. I mean, I know that's like a gift to them. Okay. But I don't use that, I forgive you. Um, I guess you're making me good, make me look good examples. That's not my point. There are times I, I blow it too. But we just have to ask the question, why am I having this conversation? Why do I want to tell them I forgive them? What do I want from them? What do I need from them? And I'm telling you, if you want or need anything from them, they have power over you. And so we have to let that, that hard umbilical cord to cut it as it were and say, I don't need that from you at all. It'd be nice if you gave it. It would be nice if you gave. If you gave me sorrow, repentance, and contrition, yes, it would help me. No doubt about that. I'm a human. Yep. It's just I don't need it from you. But it'd be, I'd want it. But it is, forgiveness is for you. It's just, it's a gift for you. The last thing, don't ever forget, your past does not define who you are. I put that in there, why we do it, just to encourage you. It's not who you are. You're not in control over everything, <laughs> usually including when someone hurts you deeply. And you can't control the event. It's in the past. You can control your response to the event. I've talked about this many times on the board. I've talked about, you know, say a blue dot or whatever. The E is for the event itself, and we can't. That's in the past, and then we have a we have a response to it. Well, we can always go back at any time. It's hard to do when I'm writing this. We can always go back and and relive the response to say, do I want to respond that way or have that belief, that behavior because of that event. And I think that is phenomenal. I have known people who had an event 50, 60, 70 years in the past, and they revisit it through therapy, and they have a totally different response. And then for the rest of their lives, they go back, now when I think about that event, I don't weep uncontrollably or try to go drink it off or sex it off or buy it off. I mean, that's amazing that God did that to me because we can't change that. But the fact that we have almost time control capacity to relit, to change our response, to that's just amazing. And it's true, it really does happen, it can happen. But the past, it doesn't define us. It just doesn't. And so it just doesn't. This response, I say totally under your control. I mean, literally speaking, no, because psychologically we're more profound and complex than that. But the point is that's under your control what you do that. Gain your power back from the event by taking control of your healing. You're defined by how you live now. You're not defined by how you formula lived or what happened to you. The past got to us this point. Now we control what to do with our past. Someone said this, I love the quote, the most influential person in your life is the one you refuse to forgive. The most influential person in your life is the one you refuse to give. I'd probably even say it a little differently. I'm also the most powerful person in your life. In that sense, they're influencing your moods, um, your thought processes. Your... We don't want to do that. So anyway, our past does not define who we are. 
And so forgiveness is possible. It, it can free you up. You can respond to an event by working toward forgiveness. And I, I think that's really, really good news. I give the analogy all the time. Again, if someone hit me on the car and I'm limping on my leg, I can't control that I got hit by a car. I can control whether I go to get physical therapy. I can't control whether I go to the hospital. I can't control whether I take meds. I can't control whether I do the homework assignments and walk a certain way, and I control that. And oftentimes when we feel so wounded, I mean, it's definition, trauma. Remember I told you the definition is when you're in a state when you feel in danger and you feel helpless. Whenever you feel in danger and you feel helpless, that's, a tra that's trauma. Well, the helpless state is, can be overwhelming, over, just overwhelming, a sense of, oh, it's coming, it's coming. And one way to get that power back is start trying to control something. It's just true. If someone walks out on you in a marriage and what can you control? Someone dies all of a sudden. What kind of control? I guess I can stand up right now. I guess I can eat. I guess I can walk from here to there. Yeah, you sure can do it. I mean, I'm telling you, it gets your brain a little bit, little bit, little bit from the amygdala that's firing off danger, danger, danger. I'm helpless. I'm scared to, I have some power here. And power means I have some ability to control what's going on in my life. And that's a good thing. A lot of Christians know you're, that's all pride. It's not all pride. I mean, it's just not. It's just not. If we stayed in a constant state of helplessness and victim mentality, we wouldn't make it. You'd be in a psych ward. You'd, you'd be suicidal. Yet everything, nothing, I have no control. I mean, the whole world would be completely dangerous to you. And that's what babies feel, which is why the mom and dad would come along and say, it's not all day, we'll get you. If you're hungry, we got food for you. Drink, we got this. And as they grow up, they're supposed to learn the capacity that the world is not completely dangerous because... I have some control of my response to the environment. If I'm cold, I have the capacity to maybe get a job and buy a sweater. If I'm hungry, I have the capacity to go find some food. And that's the sound of self-regulation that we're supposed to learn. And when we don't learn that, an event still has control over us. We haven't let it go, grieved it, maybe forgiven a person. Instead, we, we, it puts us in a constant scared position that, what if they come hurt me again? I have to be, uh, uh, I've got to keep an arm's distance. Why? Because why, really? They might hurt me. Well, then again, that's out of my control because what do they do? What do they come? They come? Okay, Shh, this time they didn't hurt me. See, that's scary. It feels like at any time I'm, I don't have control of the situation. Like I said, you don't have complete control of the environment. No one does. I mean, a, a car could come through the window. Right, of course. But we have to feel and have, to some degree, a basic sense of control of what we do. And you do. And to get out of that one more time, to get out of the mindset of constant fear-based is to say, let's start making decisions and focus on what I do have power over. Okay, that happened to me. I can't change that. No, I have no power. What can I change? Okay, I can read books on this issue. I can go to counseling. I can watch free YouTube videos. I can go to the library and get all these books for free. I can talk to friends and there. I can talk, I can start getting some power back. And it, it won't define me forever. You want to find. That's why we do it. I think there are a lot of reasons. You might have other reasons for why. Uh, I'll move on. Something else you want to add there? Questions, comments? Add, subtract? What if the most influential person in your life that you won't forgive is yourself? <laughs> what if the most influential person in your life you won't forgive is yourself? Yeah, that's it. So then, yeah, good question. If the person is yourself you won't forgive, then it means that there is a part of, I would argue, suggests that you, there is a part of you that is the most influential, and that is what we call the shamed, the wounded child. So the most influential person in your life is the shamed, wounded child. Wounded child. That's sad. It's very common people be wounded. They, I say this all. I said this often to, that uh, just the day doing therapy with a person, it's easy for us to, to walk into a room and the first part of us that's in the room is the wounded child. And then the adult and parents come follow at, at our ego states. Because the first person to walk in the room is the person who's really looking for validation, attention, love, acceptance, and whatever. And so they walk around all the time being that way. And so, I mean, ideally healthy people don't, uh, healthy people ideally realize it's in them. It's just the wounded child is not leading them. They're not making decisions for them. So what do you do? You can process the wounded child and shame-driven child and you give him or her, in your case to her, all the attention necessary and you grieve and... Um, you welcome that child. They become they become a tablet. They become part of who you are. Never, ever, ever, ever exile. Never. Be quiet. Shut up. Calm down. Uh, no one's to hear all that. Uh, you should be over this by now. None of that nonsense. None of that nonsense. No, just the part of who I am. And so you're part of me. I'm just going to keep getting better and better and heal and 
you're welcome to be here in my life. So you can. But most people who don't feel, hello, most people who don't feel permission to forgive themselves, I should say most. In my experience, oftentimes you struggle with that. It's not, again, it's not because you're a dirty, rotten sinner and so forth. It's because the, the wounded child is so full of shame, they don't feel worthy to be forgiven. They feel so, that's what shame is. I am bad. Forgiveness is for good people. Forgiveness is for other people. Why? Because they deserve it. They, th then that's nonsense, but that's the false beliefs that we tend to tell ourselves. But it's not true. It's not true at all. But it's real to the same wounded child. It feels so real. And that's why we have to get those beliefs out in the open in a journal to Jesus, to a therapist, someone that says, well, now me analyze, is this true? That I'm not worthy of being forgiven? Is it, is it true that I deserve these feelings? And you need to have someone who loves you who's honest and knows what they're talking about and says, no, no, oh my goodness. And so we, we, we work hard to be a safe place for that wounded, shameful child to have freedom to come out and play a little bit. Come talk to me. Come talk, say some more. Come on. You're just gonna make fun of me, I won't. You're gonna tell me to shut up and be quiet, I won't. You're gonna tell me to knock it off and be a cowgirl, a cowboy, no, I won't. Well, I, no, what else? Tell me, tell, just talk to me. I mean, just like a little child, talk to me. And overall, we give ourselves permission to start opening up more and more. The shame goes, oh. I start accepting myself for who I am. And, and that means wounded, shame, whatever. Like, yeah, that's where you are right now. We're not gonna stay there. But right now, that's what you feel, don't you? It is how I feel. How does that feel to feel that way? It feels awful, it feels sad, it feels rotten. I bet it does feel rotten and sad. I'm sorry, it feels that way. Like, I'm not judging, I'm not telling you to not, I'm just, tell me more about that. How does it make you feel? And that's the stuff we journal. And I could, there's reparenting exercises and therapy, I do this people often, this you, but afterwards we can talk about it, but there's ways to help repairing yourself in that moment. It can be very tear-inducing. <laughs> it can, it can be. There, there's a book on that particular issue that would be very helpful perhaps on that issue called Homecoming. Okay. Yeah, Homecoming is a, it's more like a workbook. It's a book, but it's got, each chapter is only, well, I'm telling you, it'll, it's good. It'll trigger some deep. If you do it slowly, like it says, it's, it's good stuff. Homecoming is a, whew. It's good physical therapy, you might. So you do it in bites. I mean, you don't do the whole book in one sitting because it's a, um, well, a good question. Good question. It's, it is a good question, Jennifer, because I want to make sure you understand that's a good question because you're being self-aware. You're being self-aware of that. What if I'm having a hard problem or if a person's having a hard time as we're forgiving themselves? That's a self-awareness. That's good. That's good that you're self-aware. So my encouragement is please keep following those train of thoughts and go, Hmm, is that good? Well, then what do I do about it? And what's the, and that the key, key, oh, I've said a trillion times is, is being a safe place to feel those feelings and keep pursuing that. Let that wounded child keep talking. I guess I'm scared to come out. Why? Well, I guess because talk to me, talk to me. You see what I'm saying? Just, yeah. that is so good and healthy. Let her, let her, let her come out and come to life. I'm mean, telling you. And when we're ashamed, we don't feel permission to feel sad, to feel expression emotions. Good, so middle of page six, we're on the how. So how we forgive, there's, unless there's no more question or comments about that, we'll go ahead. So we talk about what it is, why we do it, and then how. Okay, so how, uh, right in the middle, some things, frankly, aren't worth resenting. They're just not. So number one, so be honest, is it really worth the resentment? If you're overreacting, then own that and let it go. That's always the first step. I have used this in my own life a lot and go, dang, I'm, oh, yeah, that's, I'm probably blown out of proportion. I could let that go. So many things in life and go, hmm, I'm gonna choose not to let that really offend me. They probably didn't mean to do that. I'm gonna let that go. They probably didn't mean to say that that way. I'm gonna let that go. They did mean to say that. They're real punks. I'm gonna let that go. They tried to hurt me because they're a rude person. Yeah, but I'm gonna let that hurt my feelings. That is, as soon as the offense happens, we have the capacity for a lot of things, not everything, to say, I'm not gonna resent that. I'm gonna let that go. Hmm, yeah, I'll let it go. Next, what's next? Now, that's easier the more healthy we are with the self-esteem. The more wounded we are, everything bruises us. Because we're little baby children. That, and that's what happens. Like I said before, when the wounded child leads into a room, when the child leads you wherever you go, to Walmart, to the grocery store, to church, when the child walks in the door first, the child who wants to have fun, wants to be coddled, 
That's it, really. I mean, that's it. And so if they're not coddled, every idea they have has to be validated. Let's go play. That sounds good, Billy. I want candy. Sounds good. If they go, no, don't do that. Why not? It hurt. Ugh. So they, they need constant validation, affirmation, or whatever. And so any little baby thing said that the child doesn't want to hear, mm, they resent it. I don't want that toy. I don't want that song. I don't want that job. I don't want to do that. Mm. And so that's part of the healthy adult says, sometimes we can tell a little inner child that says, that's not worth it though, is it? Do we want to stay upset about that? Let me ask this question to wounded child. Do you think you're going to really care about that tomorrow? next week, a year? Do you really think that? And the child's gonna say, I don't care. Mm. And the adult ego state says, well, let's think about that for a second. Because that's what we need to do, child. We need to think for a second, go, is that worth it? Is that worth having a meeting? Is that worth the text or an email or a phone call? Is it really worth that? Well, let me ask it this way. Maybe I don't know if I'll remember that in a day or a year. The odds are I probably won't, probably won't give a rip. And there's your sign. Let me just ask you this question, self, child. Do you think you would tell someone else in the same situation that they ought to be just as upset as you are? Would you go, high five, hey man, be mad about that. They meant to hurt and be mad. Or would you go, yeah, I'd probably let that go. If you'd say, yeah, I'd probably let that go, then it's probably true for you. Maybe, and that's, so some things just aren't worth resenting and it's okay for us literally to ask the question on the inside. Hmm, God help me see that. Lord Jesus, help me see, is that worth letting go? Should I be offended at everything? Am I that fragile? And some people are fragile because they're so wounded and they want validation so much. They're just so fragile. But if it's not, you let it go. In other words, you don't need a lot of forgiveness. You go, eh. Number two, choose to begin the process of forgiveness. I mean, at some point you have to decide consciously to begin it. You get deliberate, you get focused, you own it. And at some point you go, okay, if you're a Christian, if you're not, and pagans do pagans do, I guess. I mean, Christians go, okay, I'm a Christian. I've got to start this journey. I've got to walk from here to the West Coast. i got to start some point. But I know where I'm headed because I'm a Christian. I know I'm headed as a Christian and I need to forgive. So you start the process. That is, don't be a victim to it. So how do I do it? The first is I make up my mind. I'm not saying, no, one day I'm going to start feeling like I ought to forgive. Oh, goodness, no, please don't wait till you feel like it. Oh, my goodness, no, because that means you're wounded child. Mm. No, no. What does that look like? I don't know, depending on you, the way I looks like to me in my mind is, I've said this many, oh, many times. People, I'm still trying to forgive. I think I am, I'm on the, I'm on the journey. As I go, okay, I need to forgive them. And then I go back to the, I'll say in a little second, how do I do it? Okay, first I gotta own it, what happened, blah, blah, blah. That's, so I've gotta make up my mind. I need to forgive them. Why? I'm a Christian. Jesus said, do it. I mean, he just did. If I'm not forgiving a person, he won't forgive me. That scares me to, whew. So I choose it. Um, so one thing, the first is a lot of things, you can let them go. It's not worth forgiving. It's just like, don't make it a big deal. Everything doesn't have to offend you. Don't be a fragile baby all the time. And if you are, go to a therapist, figure out why I'm so fragile all the time. Two, Choose to begin the process if you need to. Uh, three, okay, here it is. Confront the action that offended you. You must look directly at that event. E on my board here. Look directly at the event and the pain. Now, we want to avoid it by default because no one likes to feel pain besides sadist. Most normal people don't want to look at the pain. That's not, it's not a happy feeling. It doesn't feel good. But we must relive the moment to some degree, allowing those feelings to surface. And that's why we want to have a good therapist, a Christian friend, someone nearby. So when these feelings come out and you are, your wounded child is weeping, there's a safe, nurturing parent slash adult ego state in front of you or around you that says, that's okay, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And that's what we're supposed to learn as children that it is okay to cry all the time. We're never, ever, ever, ever supposed to be made fun of for that. Men, women, horses, dogs, whatever you identify as, you're not supposed to be made ever be ashamed of that. You just get, all right, say more, cry more. You got any more tears on you? Come on. You're, as long as you need to cry, cry. I got tissue, but we're not taught that. And so then we teach ourselves. We feel ashamed to cry. We feel sad and we don't want to go back to the other event. I can't go there. Why? Why? I've heard this. Why can't? Oh no. Oh man, I'll start crying. And what's wrong with that? The answer is nothing, but they feel so ashamed of it. They've been taught it is wrong to cry. That's what shame is. There's something wrong with me. No, it's not. 
when they were taught that their sadness is a burden on someone. It's not a burden at all. So the first thing in forgiveness is really confront you've got to look at what was done to you. You've got to look eyes on, even if it makes you upset. Yeah. Even if it makes you upset. Um, Linda says, what's the difference between forgiveness and making excuses for them? Good. So what's the difference between forgiveness and making excuses for them? Making mm. excuses. Well, a lot, I guess, and we'll talk more about as you go on exactly what, how to do forgiveness. But remember, for making excuses for them is not forgiving because you're simply, that's, well, first off, you're ignoring this one. You're not confronting the action that offended you. So that means you're not forgiving them. You're dismissing it. Or to use a different psychological term, you are discounting it. You're discounting so if you make excuses because they're legitimate, so for example, I'm going down and Tim actually steps on my foot. We're near the cafe. And, I, and someone goes, he stepped on your foot? I go, yeah. And they go, are you mad at him? Are you going to forgive him, resent him? I go, hmm. Oh, he didn't mean to. I mean, if he did, I don't really care. But, but you just make excuses for him. I would never let that go. I don't think he meant to, man. He just he was busy. That's not forgiving Tim and the sense of making excuses. I'm just saying he didn't mean to. Even if he didn't mean to, I'm choosing. To, I'm not going to hold it against him. I don't want. I don't care. I'm choosing that. But it's easier to forgive him when I know it was on accident. It's easier to forgive him. He didn't mean to. You just make excuses. I'm not just making excuses because I'm an adult and I'm choosing to forgive him. I'm choosing to let it go. But if you mean make excuses because we're not trying to admit there was a wrong done, people do that as well, and that's different. That's like people who were hurt, abused, raped, molested, whatever, and they go, yeah. oh, it's very, very common with parents. They did the best they could. They did the best they could. Well, first off, no, they didn't, because no one does the best they can. Have you met a human? No, they don't. Sometimes they do the best they can. Other times they don't, because that's they don't. We're frail, prideful, selfish, indulgent people. We don't do the best we can every single interaction, every moment of the day. No, we don't. So first off, no, they didn't. Your parents did do the best they could. Secondly, if they might have tried to do the best they could most of the time, great. So what? Was there ever a time they were imperfect? Yes. If they ever did something imperfect and hurt you, ever? Can you admit ever? Yes. Then you need to work on forgiveness. That's not making excuses for them. And so if you go, well, they tried the best they can, what difference? What does that matter at all? If you were hurt, it happened. Well, they were the best driver. My son had just started driving. He's about to get a license in a few weeks, so pray. Let's pray right now. Father, help, Lord Jesus, all those on the road. Amen. So let's say, for example, Hayden accidentally bumps into me. I'm walking, and he bumps in. I go, and I go on, on. Well, he's a new driver. You make excuses. Yeah, but it hurt. It hurt. Yeah, but he didn't see you well. But it hurt. He was doing the best he could. He was a young driver. It hurt. I mean, these things are ridiculous. Why are you telling me all this nonsense? I got... Hint, why can't that matter enough? And that's exactly what we, well, on that making excuses, then what we're doing is we're discounting our feelings. I go so fast to his rescue, he didn't know better, he's young, he's an accident, it was dark, it was blah, blah, blah. And that's exactly what we do to our insides when we feel shame, because we don't feel worthy to get validation. And someone's gotta stand up for that child and go, it happened, I mean, it happened. And I can feel sad about it. I can be mad at him if I want to. I can hold a grudge the rest of my life if I want to. As a Christian, I don't want to. But I'm mad. I'm angry. I'm sad. I've got to go to physical therapy now for six weeks because he broke my leg. It happened. I'm not going to make excuses for that. I'm going to work on forgiveness, sure. But the first step is, the three here, of course, is it happened. Confront that. Look right at it. I got hit. And listen, people aren't used to that. They're not comfortable. You're going to be around a bunch of people. David, he didn't. He meant well. He's new. They're going to do everything they can to make sure Hayden doesn't have his feelings hurt. Because people are so uncomfortable with hurt feelings. Then I'm going to ask the question, what about my hurt feelings? Why are Hayden's hurt feelings more than my hurt feelings? Why are his feelings more important than mine? And I've asked that before. And people just, they, that's when they're frozen. The answer is that because they're not more important than mine. And that's what we do as children. I, I could go through so many examples. My parents tried their best. Good for them. But didn't it hurt you? Yeah, then, well, they'd feel, they'd feel crushed if they knew how much they hurt me. And so what? Were you crushed? Well, just tell, yes or no. Yeah, I mean, what really? Well, yes, I was. Why are you, why is your crushed feelings less important than their crushed feelings? The answer is they're not. It's just you were taught they were less important. 
You were taught to love and support about people like your parents who did the best they could. No, they didn't. See, I mean, it's just, it's, it's sad and sick. So we don't want to make excuses for people if we're not, if we're trying to avoid the event and confront the event head on, we don't want to make excuses for them. Because I mean, we're, all we're doing then is discounting our own feelings. You don't matter that much. And that is not healthy. It's common, but it's not healthy. You're not loving yourself if you do that. Well, David, is it not true that there's some degree we should look on, the, on Hayden's side? Sure, yeah. I mean, if I sat back and said, Hayden's Satan incarnate, he's a narcissist, sociopath who can't wait to hurt. I mean, I started thinking false things about him. Well, no, someone needs to come alongside the adult ego state and say, David, brother, <laughs> no, it was an accident. He didn't mean to, do, you see, point? of course, there's boundaries there. Yeah, absolutely. No, hold on, hold on. You can be upset and angry or whatever, but those things are false. He's not a sociopath. He was an accident. You're just trying to give him, no, I'm not. I'm saying now you're labeling him these things are, but those are false. I don't hate for you to develop false beliefs about him because you're hurting. That's called irrational thinking. Irrational thinking when we feel something and then make a false belief based on those feelings. Irrational thinking. So we, then we go, and then it gets stuck in our database. Hayden is sociopath. And then we, 30 years later, oh, stay away from him. Really? Oh, he's a sociopath. Why is that? He'll kill people on his cars. Really? <laughs> Who did he kill? Well, he almost did. Almost did? He hit him with a car once. Did he really? Wow. What, what happened? He saw he was mad. No, he was 17 and it was dark and the headlight didn't work and he didn't see me. <laughs> He's a sociopath? That's what you've got from that experience? It sounds crazy because it, it's irrational. But people hold that all that, we all have these kind of crazy irrational beliefs about things because we hurt real badly at one time and our child ego stay goes, stay away from them, they're a sociopath. And we go, okay, makes sense to me, little one. High five, little baby David. No, no. Someone in that science guy says, wait a second. And that's a belief that's different from the feeling. Feel all you want, baby David. Feel sad, angry. Feel, feel, feel. Woo, you're safe. I won't tolerate false beliefs because I love you too much. No, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. That's very different. Beliefs are not feelings. They're not the same. Yes, sir. So what if we're with a person a lot who's negative? They're always negative presence. Yeah. How do we forgive them? And and they may have authority over you. And they might have authority over you. Good. Um, I'm not sure if the authority would make a difference in the process. Let me think about that for a little bit. But the first thing I'd say is, first I'd say is, almost all of us, and all of us experience those people are just negative. I mean, they're just, if they're talking, they're criticizing something or it's, they're a victim or things are bad. We've experienced those people. Two, of those people are very, very sad and wounded people. And they're really genuinely crying out for validation. So one thing that helps me around those people is, though I don't enjoy it, no one enjoys it because it's so negative, is if I go flip into empathy counselor mode, which is no matter how old they are, I'm listening to a baby complain. I'm listening to someone pout. That's what I'm listening to right now. Well, the world, the country don't know what they're doing, and my doctors don't know anything, and, and then they're, they're just crying. They just need a lot of... Ah, they're they're dissatisfied. They're uncomfortable. It's a it's a pure wounded child that you're hearing talk, and they're just so ah, it comes across as negative because it is negative. So it helps me when I'm to help some empathy, which Christian I think ought to try to have some empathy. And we go, yeah, that's sad for them. They're very wounded. That at some point in life they, at some point in life they began to believe that. For me to get attention and validation that I really really strive to need, and everyone needs it. I can get it if I focus on the negative. And they, negative people love rescuers. They love them. It's like a sick crack addiction. And rescuers love them. Because rescuers are attracted to people they can fix. Where are they? Where are they? Ging, 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 ging. There they are and run after them. I'm going to cheer you up whether you like it or not. And they're going to go, hell will freeze over. But I love the attention. I love that you come at me all the time. But deep inside, no, that won't. But so and so, they, they, yeah, they, they listen to me and 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 try to cheer me up, try to cheer you up. But both at the end of the day get real frustrated because the one who's trying to cheer you up gets mad because they don't change their mind. And the negative person doesn't want to change. And they eventually start getting, they get resentful. They go, they're always trying to cheer me up. I've heard, they're always trying to cheer me up. Look on the bright side. They don't want to be cheered up. 
rescuers want them to change. They don't want to change. So that happens. They love that. So they're wanting attention. They love rescuers for a while until they get frustrated. But as far as, uh, so that's one thing. Now, if you find yourself going to those, we call them negative Nancy's or whatever, negative Nellie's, if you go to a negative person and you find yourself being offended to the point you need to forgive, yeah, you own that. You say, what was I offended at? What really hurt me? Now, the question is, this is can be difficult, but a good journal sounds going to help. Was I, a bit, was I hurt? Let me say, no, no, better yet. Was I harmed or my feelings hurt? And they're not the same. Was I harmed or my feelings hurt? If I was just, my feelings were hurt, that is my responsibility. That means I was in my child ego state and I wanted from them something they weren't going to give to me, which is validation for me, encouragement to me, attention to me. Now we have two babies in the room, two children. One wants validation, so he or she gripes about everything. The other one's validation, and so they either sit patiently or they also start complaining or they start looking on the bright side or they, or they start bragging about themselves and they want to get someone to change their, look at me, look at me. And so then we have two ch child ego states. And when you don't get what you want, everybody, whenever we don't get what we want, what we expect, we get frustrated, we get, we get our feelings hurt. So then I would say is, ideally, we work on our own healing process to say, you know what? That does hurt my feelings. I wasn't harmed. I wasn't physically, emotionally abused. And so I'm only focused focus on that one for a second. It just hurt my feelings. Why is that? Back again, because that was my childhood state. What I wanted from that person was what they didn't give me. I wanted validation, hugs, attention, look on the bright side, change it. I wanted things from them. They didn't give it to me. It hurt my feelings. And maybe I wanted them to brag about me for a second. Maybe, what did you want from them? Just name it, own it, claim it. Yeah, if I'm de without judging it, no judging it, you just own it. Yeah, that's what I wanted from them. Yeah, I wanted a hug. Mm -hmm. I wanted a smile. I wanted a wink. I wanted some affection. I wanted about just, I mean, just own it. Maybe it's 30 things, maybe it's one thing. If you could not judge it, you'll be so better off versus you should want that. You're a Christian. You're Just knock all that <laughs> judgment junk off and just go, that is what I wanted. I didn't get it and it hurt my feelings. So then I, what do I do then? I'm giving myself, David, did that hurt your feelings? Yes, it did. I don't, I don't go, but I just go, I'm sorry, tell me more. Yeah, it made me sad, but I really wanted them to hug me and not talk about how things are bad all the time. I just want to have a good conversation and they didn't do it. I bet it was sad for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was sad. It was sad. Do you need to cry about it? Yeah, I think I do, because it makes me very sad. Okay, cry. Let's cry together. You're safe to cry. Or that goes, no, it just kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. Okay, well, that's okay too, but you're safe to feel what you want to feel. So you validate yourself, you deal with those feelings. First, step two is, okay, little wounded self, what if we change our expectations? What if I give you that validation on the inside? Two, I find other people who can give us the things we really want. Well, but, 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 but what if no one else gives it? Oh, I'll do it. First of all, I'm, I'm here with you everywhere you go. I'll always validate you. I don't leave you. I'm always with you. I'll validate you. I'm going to praise you all the stink time. We hadn't praised me in the past much. You're exactly right. I'm going to get better about that. I'm going to get better about that. You're right. I have it. I'm sorry about that. That probably hurt your feelings too, didn't it? Yes, it did. I'm so sorry. You didn't deserve that. You deserve better. We were taught wrong, weren't we? We were taught... Yep, all right, we're gonna work on that, but I guarantee you. The second thing is there are people in the world who can validate. Think about for a second, little one, little Timmy, who might be someone else in the world who might be able to give those things that we really want from the person who's critical? Is there anybody else in the world who can give it? If the answer is no, okay, well then not yet. We'll pray that God brings some other person who can do that. Maybe it's a counselor, maybe it's a person at church, maybe it's, we'll pray that someone brings up. But at first, there's yourself, and that, of course, of course, Myself means I'm going, I'm, I'm receiving the praise and validation from the Lord Jesus. But he designed us to get that from other people too. So there's nothing wrong or sinful for wanting it from hearing other humans. He designed us that way. So but God can bring people in our lives for that, support groups. So that's the first. So first I'm addressing the woundedness. Yeah, it hurt my feelings. And give it, the child all the attention he or she needs to grieve and be sad. Step two is what if we take back those expectations from that person because I don't think they're ever going to give it. But but what if, what if you're right? If they do, wouldn't it be so awesome? That'd be a good Christmas, Christmas morning surprise. But let's, let's expect that they won't do it. What if we went to those conversations expecting the person to be negative? Expect, and then here's what I want to say to myself, wounded child, and this will set you free. 
This is what I'm gonna start saying to myself. So little child, before I go into this conversation, we're gonna say this together every single time. Before we have this conversation, in my journal, on my on my bathroom window, ever, I'm gonna put, uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it's, I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't need blank from them. And fill in the blank. Whatever before you think you needed or wanted from them, own it explicitly. I don't need hugs from them. I don't need validation from them. I don't need them to be in a good mood. I don't need them to be happy. I don't need them to praise me. I don't need them to ask a question about how I'm doing. I don't need that at all from them. And you make that list of all the things you were needing before, the one your child was leading the room with that, boy, I hope they give me this, 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 this. No, we don't need those things anymore. Well, yeah, I do. You need them, but not from them. Remember little, remember little Timmy? I'm going to give it to you. You need them, but not from them. They're not ever, ever going to give it. Ever going to, they're not going to give it. What happened? Maple trees don't develop milk. It's just, you can, you can need milk to your everything. It won't happen. They cannot give it. Okay. So one is you're owning, you're giving the feelings. I feel sad about this because they hurt my feelings. And then the two, you process that. And it might take years, it might take a minute. I mean, it just depends on how long this feeling. Yeah, that did hurt my feelings. You know what? I've got 23 years of unmet expectations. It makes me sad. Yeah, grieve that. It makes sense that you're sad. It does it. Don't judge it. Step two, I don't need blank from them. Over and over and over and over and over. Even during the conversation. No, I don't need that from them. No, you will leave feeling so much more empowered. The child ego said, go, hey, I feel pretty good. I did need all those things. In fact, I expected them to be negative. That's exactly what I got. I wasn't so shocked at all. <laughs> and then the third thing is, uh, oh, well, it's, it's related. I already says you get those needs met by other people who do love you and can provide those needs as much as possible. You do. You give other people. Um, now, if someone harms you and that's what hurts you, it's both. They harmed me and that's what hurts my feelings. You have an additional thing, and that's what we talked about early on, which is you might not need to be near them at all. You might need to establish better boundaries with them. So it hurts my feelings because they cuss me out, because they call me horrible names, because they throw knives at me, because they punch me, because they hurt me. You need distance from them. All the other steps don't apply. You need to add the additional bonus, which is stay away from them. They're toxic. Toxic people are harmful not just hurtful, they're harmful. And there's a big distinction. If you lined up 100 people and said the difference, are they being harmful or do they just hurt the person's feelings or something? Most people say, oh no, that's harmful. Beating is harmful, right? Emotional abuse is real, mental abuse is real. That's harmful. And if you're ever unclear, talk to a good counselor to help you tell the difference. I'm serious, there's good books on the issues. So that's an additional bonus. Well, David, how does that relate to forgiving them? Well, if they did harm you, you got to work on forgiveness. If you harm, if you were harmed, you've got to work on forgiveness because that's a big offense. They cussed me out. They called me names. They talked down to me. They, whatever it is, they were toxic. Well, that's an offense and that makes sense. You got to name that and then for sure. But we don't have to have always forget people just hurt our feelings because it might just been our expectations and we were just we're just mistaken. Here's a good example. I was raised in the South and in the South you have manners of, and manners were particular social etiquette things that you're taught that there's social interactions and things you're supposed to say and do to demonstrate your demonstrate respect. I've learned that everywhere above the South don't really care about that. And so for example, moving to Illinois, it's different. It's just, it's just different. And when I lived in Kansas, it was different as well. So here you can walk into stores and no one greets you. They don't say, hey, how you doing? They're not, they're not extra warm. They don't show warmth to you. They're like, they don't look at you. Or if they even say anything. You go to restaurants, the owners will just stare at you. Hi, and you have to talk to them first. Hi. The, 
And that's so, in the South, it's rude. In the South, it's disrespectful. Now, I can say that really hurts my feelings when they do that. It doesn't, because I don't need them to be kind to me. But that's an example. They're not harming me by not being, by performing social etiquette routines I was taught. They're not harming me. They don't know the difference or even care. In the South, you call people titles, always. If you don't call them titles, it's very rude. You say Mr. Mrs., they have a PhD or demon, or what you call them, doctor. If you don't call them that, it's rude. It's very disrespectful. Not here, though. Uh, you have um, ladies first. You hold doors. I mean, there's a lot of things you're taught. Mm -hmm. Sir, ma'am, you don't say yeah, ever. That's why I'm almost cussing them. You don't say yeah to an adult, ever. Mm -hmm. And some own children, I, to, to this day, they say sir, ma'am, almost all the time. And when they now, they got to her. And I'll tell them all the time, and that means you're not extra Christian. It's just there are people, particularly where we live in the South, if you don't do it, they won't hear, they won't think, that hurt my feelings. There must be something. I just had a different value system. They're going to say, you're mean, you're a punk, you're rude. They will assume that because that's the social understanding. So that's the difference between harm versus hurt. It might hurt my feelings because people don't call me. And that happens. I mean, I notice that almost every day living here, I notice constantly those distinctions of social etiquette that I was raised with that I would never have done uh, that I'm not raised with. I remember when in my PhD, I was talking to a professor one time, uh, Dr. Sharon Dowd, and uh, well, I was in her office and she's the main reason I went to Baylor. She was a, a, is a marketing specialist and, and she was asking questions and I was going, oh, yes, ma'am, yes, and blah, blah, yes, ma'am. And she paused for a second. She said, you from the South? And I go, and I got nervous, of course, particularly, and I'm, I'm always... Every professor from a child at Ego State walked in the room like, oh Lord, don't kick me out. You're always just scared. They're gonna find out I'm a fraud, I'm a dummy. And so I go, yes ma'am? Like, oh, did I say something dumb or wrong, whatever? I said, yes ma'am, why? And she starts grinning, she goes, she goes, no one says ma'am, no one calls me ma'am. But she grinned like it was a good thing, so there's no one. And, I, and I, it didn't even occur to me I was calling her ma'am. Didn't even occur to me, but of course I, and I, she, I went, oh, and, I, and then she goes, oh no, that's great. She goes, it's just great to hear, she's no one there. See, that's how I was raised, though. <laughs> anyway, that's a point example of I could go around my life in you know, every day and go, my feelings are hurt because they don't obey Southern etiquette. No, I don't want to. But if someone said, I need to forgive them, I guess you can forgive them for that. That doesn't seem like the thing to forgive. It sounds to me that you have, you're just being offended too lightly. Go back to number one. Is that worth resenting? But if they really harm me, that's different. That's different. I might say, well, then yeah, I probably need to forgive them for that. Hey, Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Is that meaning your harm is uh, physically or mentally? <laughs> so good. Is harm physically or mentally? The answer yeah. is any of that. Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. Physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh -huh. That's real. That's real oh, abuse. Those are harm. Yes, ma'am. That's harm. Yes, ma'am. Calling hateful names all the time, cussing people out, uh, yeah. talking, degrading. You're nothing. You're not going to be good at uh, this, yeah. and you're a loser. And you're that is that's toxic. That's abusive. That's oh, abuse. That's just like hitting people, but worse, because then we start believing it. See, bruises can heal, but emotional wounds can last forever if we don't get those healed. So there, it's that's real. Yeah. It's uh, so confront that what happened. Uh, number four, be specific about what happened. Name it. Make note of it. Of every offense that occurred, let it all surface. And as it does, label the evil that happened to you. This is working on forgiveness, right? You're confronting it. And then two is you're being very specific. When that person did this to me, that person did this to me. This can be very difficult to do, very difficult. Sometimes you need a trained counselor or someone with you to be, or even a good friend to be with you as you talk about this. Sometimes you need a good journal page. You need to list what happened as best as you can. Um, and that's very specific because you're not making excuses for it. I'm dismiss it. Number five, you grieve what happened. And that's back to the grieving part. How do I do that? You've got to allow yourself to feel the pain, name it, grieve it. Then uh, if you don't do that, you won't heal. I mean, period. If you don't, you won't heal. Grief comes out in crying, journaling, talking about your sadness. Um, this is where thinker types go, oh, I like to think about it. <laughs> Thinking about it is not grieving. It's really just worrying or obsessing or ruminating. Thinking alone is not grieving. Allowing yourself to feel sad feelings is grieving. Thinking about it is not a feeling, that's thinking. Well, here's what I feel when I think about it. No, nope, not the same. Grieving means you allow yourself to feel sadness. You give yourself permission to do that. Number six, give yourself emotional permission to forgive. Give yourself emotional permission to forgive them. 
So it's like telling an inner hurt child, it's okay to forgive, you can let this go. When, when they're grieving, not immediately, that's a lot of y'all probably do already, which is get over it, get over it. <laughs> no, no, that's why this, this sequence matters. You confront the evil, you're real specific, you grieve it, then you, you give yourself permission. For example, I say, control your internal dialogue. This means that you cannot condemn your feelings, your thoughts, your beliefs about the process, not just get over it, you should be over this. I'm so weak or stupid to feel this way. I shouldn't feel this way because Christians forgive and forget all that nonsense. That is just like telling a real actual child, basically, shut up. I don't want to hear your sadness. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. And that's what a lot of you were taught as children. You were taught that explicitly by saying things like, be quiet, no one wants to hear you cry like a little baby. And other times we were taught that implicitly by parents not validating the pain. Well, there's many other flowers to go find. There's many other fish in the sea, breakups, whatever. You think that's bad, I've been through divorces. You were taught it's not good to be sad and that's false nonsense, but you were taught it, a lot of people were. So feelings aren't anti-Christians, they're, they're not anti-Christian rather, remember? They're just responses to our perceived beliefs like the temperature on a thermostat. Feelings are amoral and should not be judged. Feeling upset, anger, etc., cetera, but what is legitimately wrong is completely appropriate. Don't feel guilty for that. So you give yourself permission to forgive, to let it go, to feel all those negative feelings that come out. And then you give yourself time, letter number seven, to process the pain. Give yourself time to heal as you process the pain. You express your grief at appropriate times and your psyche will know when the wound is healed. It's not your job to be asking, is this what I should be feeling right now? Is this right? Is this right? Is this right? The answer is, Yes, just, just feel it. Feel it, deal with it as it comes out. And give yourself permission to grieve when it's appropriate. Permission to wait and grieve later times. Give yourself permission to move on. I'm not going to pay a life sentence for their crime. I'm doing this for me, not for them. I also need forgiveness from God. You, you replay that dialogue over and over and over and over. And as I said many a time in counseling sessions and my own self, you can give yourself certain times that you can grieve that's appropriate. I'm in the middle of checking out at Aldi's and all of a sudden I go, ah! the feelings of rage come out of what they did to me or sadness. You would tell yourself that I am triggered. That does make me very upset. And when I get home, we're going to deal with that. We'll talk about it. When I get home, we'll talk about it in my journal. I'm going to call my friend, call my therapist, whatever. Right now, I've got to get checked out. I can't lose control. I'm driving on the road at 70 miles an hour. Right now, I can't weep uncontrollably. So that's not discounting. Discounting is shut up, be quiet, your feelings don't matter. Don't do that. You're saying you are triggered, you are upset, and it's okay to be upset. Just can you hold on a little bit? Let's cry when we get home. Let's cry tomorrow. We will come back to this. You will get the attention you deserve. That's very different. That's a that's like wisdom and grieving timing. But you give yourself time to heal. David. Yes, ma'am. Some uh, other parents from Walmart, because their children are not behaving in Walmart. Okay, later on, uh, I will. I'll talk to you. Okay, I'll talk to you later on. <laughs> wow, I said, oh, maybe she she's gonna lecture the the boy or the girl, <laughs> because she said, watch watch out. Okay, just just. Just wait. I will yeah, just wait. do something to you later on. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes parents say, you wait when we get home. Yeah, you wait. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes there's wisdom in that. Yeah. Sometimes there's wisdom in that. Say, oh, we're, yeah. So that's what's happening with forgiveness. And I'll, before we wrap up a little bit, I'll come back and see if there's any examples you want to role play together. I'm happy to do that with you. The last thing is you might need a non-judgmental friend or therapist who can help you. You, you might need that. Depends on the level of the harm that was done to you or the, or the hurt feelings you have. Don't be ashamed to receive, please don't be ashamed to receive counsel. If you are, if right now you're hearing me and you are an ashamed child all the time, when you're like, me, don't be ashamed. You might as well just said, shkubla, shkubla, shkubla. like that's all I do is live in shame. But <laughs> try to hear me say it. You don't need to be ashamed. You don't need to. You just, you don't need to. I mean, you just don't, if my tire goes flat, I need to go to the tire work a warehouse no i don't no i don't no i just no no i should be able to fix the rubber on that tire at home right now i feel so ashamed to need the tire replaced by a mechanic oh it's awful no it's not my leg is throbbing and turning blue i should go to the doctor no 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 i should know everything there is to know about biology and the human anatomy 
No, you don't. I'm feeling sad right now and overwhelmed. No, no, you don't. Don't talk to me about it because you should be over this. You should have enough faith and learn how all your feelings, because they're in you. Well, the lack was part of me too. And I own the tires on the chart. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's in you. The issue is maybe you don't have the capacity to deal with it enough. I have a therapist friend. I've talked to counselors for years. Good heavens. I mean, yes, talk to me. I go, even something just a checkup. Here's how I'm doing. Does this sound right? I mean, just, ooh, let that shame go. Who gives a rip? I love talking to good therapists. Man, they have human behavior. I go, man, that's a good point. I wish you told me 30 years ago. I love it. it. Sets me free, man. Sets me free. Now, if you are that friend for that person, here's some tips, real quick tips. If you're that friend for someone else, be with them in their grief. Number one, Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Listen, validate their pain. You're validating pain and sadness. You're not telling them what to feel because you're with them. You're sad with them. It's your job to be a safe place for this terribly chaotic, unsafe feeling that a person's experiencing. By the way, you can do this to yourself, but you want to find a person who's done that for you. And then you want to affirm appropriate behavior. For example, again, remember all the time, this is so important. Feelings and behavior are not the same thing. You validate feelings to your nose bleeds. I'm so sorry you feel that way. That makes sense. Uh, I feel sad too. I, I mean, I'm so sorry you're hurting. Tell me more. Tell me more about your sadness all day long. But then there's behavior and beliefs. We don't have to approve all those because those can be false. Feelings aren't false. They're just feelings. They're not Christian. They're not more. They're all moral things. Pay attention to them. Hug them. Then behaviors and beliefs can be false, and those need to be challenged when they're false. So it's okay to be angry right now. It's okay to weep like that when you're at home, of course. But you can encourage change when needed. Have you eaten a meal lately? That's behavior. When is the last time you exercised or went for a walk? You don't preach to them. You're just saying, let's watch the behavior. If you're uncontrollably weeping, you're with the weep. Now say, now, what are you doing to help you a little bit along the way? How are you eating some protein? I understand you're very angry, but what's the way to express that anger when you don't cuss out the clerk? I understand you're very angry. What's the way we can do that when we don't have road rage where you're about to kill people? I understand you're angry. So you, the anger makes sense. If, so what are ways we can help process in a way that we, you see, that's the difference. Ideally, that's what we're supposed to do ourselves. We're supposed to have learned that as children. But if you're that friend for someone else, that's what you're doing. Um, but again, don't jump to the, are you doing this? Then you all of a sudden they come across, you're trying to fix it. That the sequence matters. You're with them in the grief and pain and sadness and anger. Stay with them there for a while. And when that feels like that's coming a little bit to a close, maybe after weeks or maybe after 30 minutes, I mean, I don't know, then it's, these kind of go together. My own personal thing is if someone's having a really, really hard time, really hard, and this is, I've happened in my line of work. So let's say I meet with about an hour. Um, I might spend 50 minutes listening to the grief and 10 minutes giving some tips on exercise or for behavior. They need to feel it. They need to be a wounded child in my presence and safe presence and say, and that's my chief goal. So I don't jump, I don't have five minutes of their sadness and then 55 minutes to get over and here's how you fix it. No, and know your own boundaries. Does the other person no good if you break down weeping every single time you're with them? It just doesn't. You can't fix it, you can't make it go away, period. So don't know your own boundaries and avoid what's called transference. And it's don't let their problem become your problem. Now if you can't separate sufficiently, then tell the person you can't listen anymore. Help them find someone else. And that's okay to do that. Say, I'm so sorry. Man, your hurting hurts me so badly. In fact, it hurts me too much. You know, really, honestly, it's triggered my own childhood. And that's, it's been so difficult. I have a hard time listening to you pretty objectively and trying to help and be, I can't really be there for you because now all of a sudden it triggers me. And now I'm terribly sad and you can't be there for me. And I don't want you to be because you're hurting. Well, now we're two really, really hurt children. And neither one of us should get what the other one needs. And so on that particular issue, unfortunately, I won't be able to be a good listener for a while. And, but I'm grateful too that you've done this because now it tells me I need to do more counseling. And so I've made a scheduled appointment to talk to so-and-so tomorrow. And I've got to go to the roots of this too. And so does that make sense? Just know your own boundaries. That's okay. You're not a burden to me. Your sadness isn't making me mad. It just means I, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of losing control too. And I don't want to do that. I want to be there for you. And I can't be there for you in the moment if, I, if it triggers all this in me. And sometimes we just don't have the skill set. Say, I'm so sorry, I don't have the skill set to really help. But I care for you, and I'm so sorry. 
what can I do to help you otherwise? Do you want me to help you think through there are the counselors you don't know or if that can point you in that direction? And of course, you pray for them, you serve them. You don't have to be a therapist. Maybe you can cook a good roast. Maybe you're like, oh, I can walk. You want to walk tomorrow at six o'clock? I know how to walk. Praise God. I've got shoes and um, what's your number? I can text you scripture verses, encouragement. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do that aren't. You can know your limits, along your boundaries, that's all. Well, David, what if I'm stuck and I'm having a hard time forgiving them? I only have two major questions, I guess, if, I, if you have a hard time. One is, have you really grieved enough? If you really grieved enough, most people haven't grieved enough, and they have a hard time letting it go, and I still just have such rage to that person. Have you not gone back to the first step, which is, have you really confronted what was done to you and validated that pain? Have you gone back and said, have you really gone back the steps? Have you really grieved enough? I assume that when a person asks. I don't assume they're a punk trying to hurt the other person by being so mad all the time. I assume they're wounded. And that's usually a safe assumption. But then there is option number two, which is, are you trying to stay in what we call the one-up position of power because it makes you feel safer, makes you feel superior, or you enjoy feeling right, or something else? And some people do. Some people don't want to forgive because... I like feeling I have it over their head. It's like if a person, say a spouse, does something or has an affair and the other spouse says, no, I'll never forgive you. And they bring it up all the time. They go on and on and on. It makes them feel good and happy. I Now I can kind of control you like a little marionette or I can rub in your face or I can show power. It makes you feel good on the inside. Because Why? Because I feel safer for a little bit. I'm in the one-up position. I have a powerful position. So yeah, you won't forgive them because you don't want to let that go. Because if you let it go... I lose my power. If I lose my power, I'm going to be hurt again. That's the belief system, but that's all false. You might be hurt again. It doesn't mean you'll be hurt again. But that's an irrational thought that you got from your child ego state that says, no, 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 please protect me. Let's get real, real tough and hold it against them forever because if I don't, they will always hurt me again. Let's do it. And that's false. That's an irrational belief. So typically forgiveness involves just you haven't grieved enough and processed these steps. Well, in the 10 minutes that we have left, what question or comments do you have? And do you, do you need me to role play at all on, on these issues? Anything at all? Anybody on the line say anything, if you don't mind? Anybody? Um, all that's on here is Crystal Stude. Cr so Cr Crystal Stude. Bo Stude, a.k.a. <laughs> number one fan since 2016. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bo and Crystal. Sweet, sweet. Speaking of farmers, they're farmers and sweet, sweet family. <laughs> Precious little kids, too. Anything about grief or forgiveness? Anybody online, too? They always say time heals. Is that, you know, sometimes. Always take time to heal? Yeah, so sometimes it takes time to heal. No, time will heal there. Yeah, time will heal. There, there, there. Time heals minor offenses, sure, because we literally forget them. Yeah. I don't remember stuff that happened in the seventh grade. I'm, I'm sure I was really offended. I don't remember that. But time does not heal significant offenses, significant hurts and harms. Time does oh. not heal that. It does not heal that. Time does not heal significant offenses. It does not heal significant offense. That's right. So when people say time heals all wounds, that's demonstrably yeah. false. It does not heal all wounds. It heals some wounds. Okay. And that's such conventional wisdom on movies. Just give it time. Okay, okay, sounds good. I hope time deals with it. Praise God. If that's all it takes is time, woo, high five. But if not, then what we like to do is feel guilty because we still feel it. Maybe it's not year 30 yet. Maybe it's in year 40. Anyway, go well, on. <laughs> anything else in that? Well, thank you all for coming. Thanks for watching online. Thanks for listening online. And if there's any way I can help, otherwise I'll try my best. Send me an email, text on my Twitter at Dr. D. Pendergrass or on my Facebook page at Glimpse of the Kingdom. And I'll be happy to try my best to help when I can. So grief and forgiveness, good good processes to go through. Can I pray for us?
pray us out, yes. and you'll forgive me that I'm early. Uh-huh. If not, you can get over it. I'm okay. just kidding. <laughs> we can grieve it. <laughs> we thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for the capacity to grieve. It is a genuine gift. God, I confess on my part, maybe not for the people, it doesn't always feel like a gift because it's so unpleasant feeling. But I do thank you that it is a gift, that when we are wounded and we've experienced loss, you give us that capacity to process that so that it does not control us forever and that our past does not have power over us. It doesn't have to have power. And I'm thankful for that capacity. I really am. I'm sure other people are. I also thank you for the capacity to forgive people. And God, we know as Christians that if it, well, when we forgive, if and when we forgive, we've done so through your power, your grace, through your love, and, and genuinely your perfect example of how to do it and that it can be done. So please forgive through us. Please forgive through us. Please help us take these steps seriously and confront the issue and then work on letting go of the desire for punishment. God, you deal, please help us let you deal with other people as you see fit. We recognize and confess that you don't need our help. You'll deal with the situation just fine. But in the meantime, Holy Spirit, please help us when we are hurt and certainly when we're harmed and hurt, please help us grieve. Please help us validate even ourselves. Please help us hear your voice in us that says how very sorry you are that we're sad and how proud you are of us to process those feelings. And that we would shut down voices that tell us to be ashamed, that tell us to be afraid of admitting uh, any kind of quote unquote weakness or sadness. Please help us feel strong in our capacity to look squarely in the eyes of whatever hurt us and give ourselves the due attention and love that we deserve. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the capacity to heal. We also ask Holy Spirit, before we leave here tonight, as usual, please help us not be people who harm others. If and when we do, please give us the courage and the capacity and the grace to own that and then ask for forgiveness and say we're and apologize and mean it and then change. We thank Holy Spirit for loving us and giving us a chance to do better each time. To the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.